So what you did, yeah, some pretty lines. You made a phylogenetic tree. Today's the 23rd. Um, and we said that a phylogenetic tree is something that shows how closely related organisms are. What you did today is exactly how organisms used to be classified. Literally. So what, what do you know about biological classification? What do you know about that? Okay, every living thing on the planet is classified biologically. It has a species name, it has a genus name, every single living thing, from a bacteria to a blue whale to an elephant to a bacteria in your gut, a daffodil, a maple tree. Um, sugar maples are Acer sacrum, red maples are Acer rubrum, humans are Homo sapiens, raccoons are Procyon lotor, beavers are Castor canadensis. Everything has a name, a biological name. And how do we figure out what things are related? The way it used to be done was literally what you just did. <coughs> looking at physical characteristics. And when I say looking at physical characteristics, um, I've done the opposite end of classification work. So the, the, the front end of it is a biologist goes out, woo, finds this species, examines its characteristics, and sees if it fits into any species that we already know about. If not, they get to name it. The other end is, ooh, I just found this species I need to figure out, or I, I just found this bug. I wonder what species it is. And going into the lab, and this is, I, I loved doing this work. So who here has ever looked really close up at an insect? Don't okay. they have something like that, the they may. The, I it when it went, you put in this little thing that had like bacteria on it. Well, that's, that would be a microscope. That's a little different. So like with an insect, you know, you know that, you know, here's our little bug that we looked at. We know they have six legs. Well, what you might not know is that each one of those legs has got a whole bunch of different parts. So that might be one bug leg, and it's got five parts. And you have to look under a microscope and count how many hairs are on the third segment of that insect leg. Because if it's got three hairs, then it's this species. And if it's got six hairs, it's that species. You're looking at physical characteristics, morphological characteristics. And how different are those morphological characteristics? And I can't remember the names for all the insect leg parts. Tarsus, pretarsus, tibia, an axillary something. Anyway. But, you know, you're looking at the, the actual individual characteristics of each of those pieces. The more similar two things are, we think, oh, the more, the more recent was their common ancestor. Okay? That's how it was always done. There's a better way now. So we, we've talked about evolution and the, the three big categories. What's the first big category? Um, gradual change through history from stuff that looks really weird to us to stuff that looks pretty familiar. Gradual change, fossil record. Second big category. Okay, we got structural evidence. We got homologous structures. We got vestigial structures. Those provide evidence. The third, chemical, chemical evidence. And what's the big chemical we've been talking about? DNA. So guess how we actually do this process of building phylogenetic trees now. How many differences are there in DNA? Because remember, we said, like, all humans share 99.999% of your DNA. You and a human who is as different from you as possible share 99.999% of your genes. So we can look at the number of differences in DNA sequence. So where that little table you had, you were looking at the number of differences in seven different characteristics. We can say, okay, there are between 30,000 and, gosh, some species only have like 32 genes. We have 30,000 genes. Some species have 100,000 genes. Yeah. In that DNA sequence, how many differences are there from species A to species B? 
So rather than having that little table show the number of differences in physical characteristics, we start to build a little table that looks remarkably like it. A, B, C, D, E. But now we're talking about numbers of differences in DNA sequence. So it might be 13 differences in DNA sequence. It might be 172 differences in DNA sequence. It might be three differences in DNA sequence. It might be 42, 73. And we can look now at the number of differences in DNA sequence and we can start to build a phylogenetic tree that says, oh, well, A and D probably share an ancestor in the really recent past. There are only three differences in their DNA sequence. So among animal species, let's think about rodents. Who doesn't love rodents? I like some rodents. I don't much care for rodents in my house. They do eat stuff, and they pee every place, which that's the part that really yeah. bothers me, the little, the little pee and pee trails and poops little around. poops laying around. Yeah, I don't like that. But anyway, okay, so name me a rodent species. James and I were just talking about one. Mice. Guinea pig. Guinea pig. Ooh, that's a good one. Nobody mentioned that this morning. Somebody said rats. What else? No, actually. Uh, this is the clue. Uh, Rabbit. Beaver. Uh, no, rabbits are not a rodent. Actually, they're a ligromorph. Um, nutria. Muskrats. Moles. Moles are not. No. Chipmunks. Chipmunks are. Squirrels are. Those are all rodents. Chinchillas? I don't know. I'd have to look that one up. I have, they are adorable. They're fuzzy. Like, get two chinchillas and keep them in your pocket and your hands would be warm all winter. Um, huh? No, they're a mustelid. They're a mustelid. Okay, so when we talk about all these different rodent species, how do we figure out which ones are most closely related? We look at their DNA sequences. Yeah. So um, we look at their DNA sequences. If we were to take, so I've got this example on the board from our data from the other class. A, C, one difference, B, two, E is there, and then F and D seem to be very closely related. So on that park exam, that end of year exam that you're going to take um, in the spring, this is kind of a big deal, this sort of, you know, using um, phylogenetic data to, let me clean that up a little bit, to look at evolutionary relatedness. So if I gave you some pairs of species here, and I said, based on the phylogenetic data here, which pairs of species would you presume to be most closely related? D and F, D and E, D and B, or D and C? Yeah, D and F are most closely related. They share a common ancestor in the more recent past. Which of these pairs of species would you assume to be most closely related? A and C or A and E? A and C. A and C. They share a common ancestor in the more recent past. Um, what about A and B or A and D? A and B. There's their common ancestor. So that's the kind of question that they could ask. They could also say something like, which of these species would have fewer differences in their genetic sequence, A and C or A and E? A and C. They're more closely related. They have fewer differences in their genetic sequence. Um, remember we said humans and chimps share 99% of their DNA, identical. Humans and a mouse share like 90%. We're both mammals. Um, Humans and, what did I say, fruit flies are like 60%. I don't know. So we can look at this 
and look at how closely related two species are in the evolutionary past based on how much of their DNA sequences they share. Now, you had some where like, well, B and A had two differences, but B and C had three. Why did B and C look as close as A and B? When we're doing this based on just looks, so you're just looking at the species and you're figuring out based on appearances how closely related they are. Not every change in DNA changes appearance. Okay? So not every change in your DNA changes an external appearance of an organism. Um, does anybody here know what hemophilia is? We'll talk about it more when we do our genetics stuff, which will be in the spring. Okay, so hemophilia is a genetic disorder, it's a genetic disease, and people who are hemophiliacs do not clot. Their blood does not clot, which means bruising, huge problem for a hemophiliac. They can die because what is a bruise? It's little broken blood vessels under the skin, but your body stops the bleeding, it caps them off. A hemophiliac doesn't. They would continue to bleed under their skin. Um, a simple cut, you know, cut yourself with a knife in the kitchen. You hold pressure on it and hold it up in the air like this until it stops bleeding. For a hemophiliac, that doesn't happen. It just continues to bleed. Yeah, it's serious. Now, there are, you know, for a hemophiliac who, like, you know, cuts themselves on a knife in the kitchen, that means a trip to the emergency room for them because there are, actually, they probably keep this stuff at home. There are um, chemical agents that can be applied that can stop bleeding, but their body will not clot that by itself. Now, if I line up 10 people up here and I say, one of them is a hemophiliac, pick them out. You can't do it. They have a change in their genetic sequence from the other nine people up here, but there's nothing that you look at and say, oh, I see that change in your DNA. You can't tell. So not all changes in DNA are obvious. Um, okay, what we're going to do is I want you to turn in the packet with the back page with your drawing stapled. And then I want you to take a few minutes and summarize your notes for yourself. So do it on Joseri, do it on paper, do it on whatever, but that process of pulling it together and summarizing it for yourself. And we talked about this, but we didn't say it in so many words. Biological classification is a system of grouping living things by their characteristics. And now also we do it by their DNA sequences. That's only been possible in the last 15 or 20 years. Okay, summarize your notes for yourself, and tomorrow we'll finish the notes.